Thanks, Chris. It's uh, great to be here. So, I mean, we're definitely doing a lot more collaboration and cooperation with Ubuntu. Um, and why are we actually collaborating with Ubuntu? Because it's one of the host operating systems that we've actually embraced within our telco NFE product portfolio. And going forward, we're working a lot more with Chris's team. And the plan that we basically have is to make sure all our VNFs can actually be instantiated and certified on a Ubuntu cloud. And for that, it's really, really important to actually work with somebody that actually gets what we actually need, will actually be willing to work with us hand in hand, and actually do the small little minor tweaks that we actually need to make sure that we can take a VNF, have the same SLA, same runtime characteristics, running on a Ubuntu cloud. And that's really all NFA really needs to be. It's not really hard, but for some reason, a lot of people are coming here and they're just saying, well, you know, just take your VM, put it, or take your application, put it in a VM or a container, and then basically just install it on third-party components. It's not quite that simple. And I think a company like Ubuntu actually get it because they've actually been like, you know, playing around with operating systems in the depths, basically. And we've been collaborating a lot more with Ubuntu going forward to make sure you know, we get our VNFs basically to be instantiated, to be certified on a Ubuntu cloud operating system. So we can deliver the same SLA as if it was basically in the same physical component hardware box. But to our end customers, they can actually pick whatever specific x86 hardware from different vendors that they want, from different PCI vendors. And that for us, it's really, really important because we want to provide flexibility to our customers. We're not so interested basically in shipping them monolithic boxes anymore. We're interested basically in shipping apps. We're shipping apps in containers, and we want to have a host operating system that can actually give us the same characteristics as if it was basically us doing the fine tuning. And that's really what Ubuntu is actually able to deliver for us in Ericsson. So we're actually doing a lot of like development and testing, CICD basically all based on Ubuntu. Okay? Thank you very much, Thank Alan. you very much, Chris. Thank you. Um, so we're very excited about that work with Ericsson and very excited to be working with telcos and customers with Ericsson um, in, the, in the coming, uh, coming months and certainly in, in 2015. So let's take a step back a little bit um, um, from there. As I said at the beginning, we see OpenStack in private infrastructure as a service, public infrastructure as a service, and a network function virtualization in telcos right now. And can you put your hat, if you're a telco right now, people using private infrastructure as a service on OpenStack, some examples in the room. We know AT&T with Silver Lining is a great case study here. NTT, do a lot of work with them um, uh, in terms of private infrastructure. It's how developers want to develop apps. You may have a very large bill at the moment on AWS, and the question is how do you bring that development internally? We talk to lots of customers now who will say that even though they're a telco, even though they have hosting operations, they may be spend spending a million, two million, three million dollars a month on AWS. And that really doesn't make sense for businesses that take pride in running large hosting operations themselves. These teams have often moved very early. We see public infrastructure as a service here in France, CloudWatt, Numagy, two fantastic examples of, of clouds that have been backed by um, SFR and Orange, both running OpenStack based on Ubuntu and then making public infrastructure as a service available. And then uh, network function virtualization, and we're doing work um, uh, in the background involved in projects like TerraStream and Domain 2.0 um, um, with AT&T. So let's, that's OpenStack in the telco. Let's take one step up again from there and think about what is the real problem that we're trying to solve here. And the problem we're trying to solve is addressing these three massive changes in the industry. Declining revenues, existing products simply not um, profitable or not growing in terms of their contribution to the business. Extraordinary growth in terms of the requirement for, for, for connectivity, for bandwidth, often from over the, um, the top providers who are consuming that bandwidth and not necessarily contributing back to the costs of building it out. And then this third big challenge, which is new providers entering the market, Google Fiber, companies like Free here in France, who are attacking the problem without some of the legacy hardware and infrastructure that um, some of the incumbents have. This is a, a perfect storm of challenge for the, for the industry, and it needs to be addressed not just through NFE, but through a fundamental change in both the use of commodity hardware and in um, uh, the use of, of scale-out operations that we would more typically see in a startup. And to that point, I just think it's worth dwelling on the WhatsApp case study. Now, 
WhatsApp last, uh, I, I saw data um, from Andreessen and Horowitz on Friday. They're handling now 7.2 trillion messages a year. Total text messaging, text messages a year now in, in the world, 7.3 trillion. It's the same number of messages. And what's the number that really stand out, stands out about WhatsApp? It's not the $19 billion they sold for, okay, although that is a big number. <laughs> okay. The number that stands out to me is 32. Anyone know why 32? 32 engineers in all development and all operations. Now, they've got 550 million users, 40, so 32 engineers. That's one engineer for development and administration per 14 million users. Take that same ratio and apply it to British Telecom. How many people are they now allowed to employ to do messaging at BT? Six. For all development of all voice, text, and video messaging. Take the number to AT&T. It doesn't get much better. You're at 24. Okay. That's the challenge that we, we have to address. And um, so on that note, thinking about that problem as being much bigger than just, um, of, uh, just virtualizing um, VNFs, that we have, we have to fundamentally reinvent how telcos develop and then distribute services. Martin. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction there. So if we look at those new players, we actually would love more telcos to behave in exactly the same way. So what do they do differently? This slide says how many machines there are per human. Now, there's no numbers on there, but like, if you have a data center yourself, how many humans uh, or how many servers are there per human operator? Any guesses? A good run data center. There's about... <laughs> that would be too optimistic. There's about 200 if you're running a good data center. Now, if we look at these companies, how many are there per human operator? There's actually 20,000. So one person is responsible for 20,000 servers. How can they do it? Well, that's something that we want to explore later on. Another thing that's happening as well is that this, this avalanche of new software coming out, all of it uh, here is, is open source, so you can go and try it. But you just don't have time in a day to try all those new things. And it's completely different than how you used to design software. So managing this, Getting to use this in exactly the same ways as the ones that wrote it is really important. You need to be able to be very lean and have the right ways to go and apply this everywhere in your organizations. It's not easy. So how do we want to help you? Well, first thing is, what the Googles and the Facebooks and, and others have taught us is you have to think scale out instead of scale up. Bigger boxes are no longer enough if you're dealing with 500 million users uh, doing things. You need to design things differently. And this is exactly the reason why our operating system is used so dominantly in public clouds. Because it's written for scale out. It assumes that IPs are not static. It assumes that there are changes happening all the time. We're also working together with like, the Facebooks and others on, on open compute hardware, the type of hardware that no longer is installed little by little, but they just wheel it in. And it's all open, open source hardware that you can see uh, and, and purchase uh, as well. And of course, putting OpenStack on there makes it then extremely easy to, to get uh, the best out of that hardware. But what if you have to deploy hundreds and hundreds of servers like they do on a daily basis? You can no longer go with a USB stick everywhere or with uh, a DVD as you used to. This is where we want to help. We've made an open source tool called Mass Metal as a Service, and it basically allows you to provision operating systems on that bare metal from zero. 
It provisions Ubuntu, but you might be surprised also to know that uh, it does Windows and pretty soon uh, CentOS and other operating systems as well. So if you need to provision large amounts of servers, you should definitely take a look at it. But the real problem is, what do I do with those virtual machines once I can get them in minutes? It's like climbing a mountain. You're climbing, you think like three months to get a server, now you get it to three minutes, problem solved. Well, you actually find there's a bigger mountain afterwards. You now have to integrate the software, and it takes you three months, six months, 12 months. What we think is that it actually should take you three to 12 or 50 minutes at most to deploy complex solutions. And for that, we made a new tool, and it's also open source, it's called Juju. And we wanted to come and show you how it works with workloads that interest you, not the WordPresses and the other type of things that you might see everywhere deployed. No, we want to show you telco workloads deployed, integrated, and scaled in minutes. So it's demo time. Thank you, Martin. So my name is Samuel. Uh, I'm going to present you an integration of a global voice service system. So if you want, you can take your phone and call that number. And you're going to ask, be asked a few questions. So you can do that at any time. You can do that from now to the end of the demo. So let's have a look at this workload, which is I want people to call a system, be a, question, a few questions, record the answers, process them, and show a dashboard of that. To do this, I'm going to need 15 VMs in this example, and it's I need uh, phone numbers. That's the uh, first thing. Don't need VM for that. Then I need uh, an, an IMS, so core of a telco uh, network. I need the answering machine, so an IVR. Uh, then I need to collect information to process it, and I need to send it to the dashboard. So that's good enough to start with. Then eventually, you're going to have to move that to production. So what you want then is to add monitoring, log management, and TP, and that's a bare minimum. Eventually, you're going to have also backup solutions. Did you change the so if you look at it, usually in a, in a standard environment, it's going to probably take you a couple of months. Now, what we want to do with smart tools is downsize that to 30 minutes. So how do we do that? We think that we can design once and deploy many. So we're going to move to the demo. I'm going to switch to another screen. OK. This is the infrastructure that we are deploying. It's currently on my Amazon, right? So you can see on the left here three nodes, which are the IVR, which you saw horizontally before. This is the core of the network. And my screen is very small, so we can't see the other bits here, but it did um, move to production bits. Now I can export that. It's going to save a bundle.yaml. This file, you can send it to anyone, and they can now, on another Juju instance, import it. OK, so I've got it prepared for you with all the bits and pieces. It's going to deploy, and there it is. That is the environment of your client. It's another environment. It's your local computer, if you run it on containers. It's anything. So you design a workload once, and you can ship it to someone else, and they can run it immediately, plus adding some few bits of configuration, and that's it. So now, if you call the system, we should see those bits and pieces moving, because those are your calls actually being processed. So you can see the three questions are asking your role in OpenStack, uh, asking which distribution you're using, and asking where you are in deploying OpenStack. And then the system also processes your location. So the map on the top right is uh, displaying where is your base operator. So who's calling? I'll do a call for you if you want. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So that's our VoIP system.
Pearl Lady. There is demo time effect. Try again. Okay. I'll do it again. Mm? Okay. Bad luck today, or before. So we'll switch back to uh, the presentation. Okay. <laughs> yes. Now, if you walk through uh, the conference, you probably have seen SDN or Software Defined Network about 50, 100 times everywhere. It seems to be that a lot of companies uh, think there is uh, a reason to have it differently done. And we actually want to help operators find which one is best for them. So that's why we did the OpenStack Interability Lab. So thanks to Juju, we can actually deploy OpenStack like Lego blocks, but also take out one block and put another one in there. This allows you to put any SDN in there. And it's not only us that can do this. Anybody can do this. You can choose an SDN, put it in there, test if this one is the right one for you, and redeploy with another one and another one and another one. So in that same day, you can test multiple times um, an OpenStack deployment with different components. We do it about uh, 3,000 plus times every month. And we don't only do it with SDNs, we also do it with storage and hypervisors, and we do it with the latest trunk uh, versions every day. So if you are a provider of SDN uh, solutions or storage solutions or anything like it, and you want to test, OIL is the program that you want to talk uh, to us about. And there's uh, some relatively big companies here uh, that uh, are uh, joining you. All right, so we've covered this concept that there are, we want to accelerate um, productivity within development teams. And that means being able to access as a team lots of modular blocks, bringing them together, and, um, and then being able to roll out services quickly. Um, the other part we're saying is that there are more and more parts of your infrastructure with, um, with oil that you can then use and test. So what about OpenStack itself? Like, What does Ubuntu as an operating system and then as a provider of OpenStack provide to this ecosystem? So we really think of just two use cases. And one is a reference OpenStack, which for many um, uh, data center clouds is um, easily adequate. And there are two options that we do there. We um, help telcos sometimes operate those clouds with our offer, which is Bootstack, where we'll actually operate a cloud for a telco, and then they can focus on um, running services on top and reselling them. Or we'll help support people actually build those clouds. But as we go into the real NFV use cases, OpenStack itself, and in fact, general distributions, need work to make them really suitable for the type of use cases that um, people like Alan have got to address underneath the core network. And so for there, we talk about extreme OpenStack. And for, that, for us, that's an engagement where we'll work with a particular telco, and let's say look at IPv6 support throughout the whole of OpenStack, and whether or not that has been properly supported. How do we deal with workload isolation? How can we pin workloads to a specific cause um, on a system? Um, how can we deal with telco-specific security requirements? All the time that we do that work, we're trying to make sure it's done upstream and um, arriving quickly in OpenStack itself, and then making it available um, in the standard distributions. But we recognize at the moment there's still a lot of work to be done on standard um, OpenStack itself to make it suitable for full NFV workloads and also on um, the distro itself. Any question on that sort of reference versus extreme and, and what needs to be done to OpenStack itself? No? All right. So what I wanted to do was to get two very exciting ISVs to come up here who've um, been instrumental in, um, in making progress around open um, um, VNFs and getting them ready 
Um, and I wanted to first invite up um, here Paul Drew, who's the general manager of the uh, Project Clearwater at MetaSwitch, um, to come on stage and talk a little bit about the project and uh, what you're doing with it on top of OpenStack. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Let's see if I can just switch slides here. Have you got them here? Uh Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very grateful to Chris and um, the rest of the Ubuntu team for giving us the opportunity to talk here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about MetaSwitch networks and then Project Clearwater and one other project we've got, Project Cla Calico, which plays into the open space, um, uh, OpenStack network um, and the networking space. Um, so as um, Chris mentioned earlier on, basically, the whole network, telecoms networks, are moving towards being software-based. It is all going cloud-based with generic hardware. And this is very much where MetaSwitch Networks is playing as, um, as a vendor. We've been a long-standing vendor in the network, um, been deployed for around about 30 years. We have uh, about 650 employees with 1,000-plus global customers, service providers, selling into OEMs as well. Um, so we've got a long heritage of building software and um, now cloud-based solutions. And I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the demo. Um, so this is the sort of the architecture. So Samuel showed this demo earlier on. As you saw, several of you called in on your mobile here. It actually went through a true phone network. Um, they're based in the, the UK. That was the number you dialed, the UK number. It's owned by true phone. Truefone then forwarded it on to the Project Clearwater. That was what was instantiated via the Juju um, running um, actually in the cloud infrastructure. And we've got the Telestacks there um, with their application. So when you made an incoming call, it hit the IMS core. The IMS core looked up the number terminating, applied terminating services, was forwarded it onto RESCOM. The IVR that you actually heard was implemented on RESCOM, and then the um, pushed data into the dashboard, and that's what Samuel showed as the dashboard, where you can see in real time the uh, results of the survey that it was doing. So that's where Project Clearwater sat in that demo and how, how we fit. It is basically designed as an open source IMS core running in cloud infrastructure. Um, so we took the view that we were going to start off and build a, a ground up cloud-based VoIP platform. Um, an IMS core, IMS-based platform taking cloud technologies. We use open source databases like Cassandra and Memcached to allow it to scale. Very much based around at various discussions about how you scale a WhatsApp or a Facebook. These are the sort of technologies they use to scale their deployments. And this is what I think we need to do in the telco space. Like, come from a heritage of building and scaling out, uh, scaling up with software, but actually to scale out and have multiple versions, pools of servers with distributed databases, it really helps to design it from the cloud and leverage it, put it in the cloud infrastructure. So this is what Project Clearwater is. Um, it's open source IMS core, supported by MetaSwitch Networks. We offer, much like a lot of open source platforms, uh, support infrastructure that fits around it. It's built around open source um, and open standard APIs. And then just one final thing we're also doing in the OpenStack um, and networking infrastructure, uh, Project Calico. It's another open source platform. Um, if you look on the left, this is a standard diagram of an open stack networking stack. Uh, it is deliberately there. It is a complicated diagram. I'm not going to attempt to go through it, but it's based around VLANs and overlays. Um, Project Calico is replacing all of that and putting in the layer three infrastructure, a rooted infrastructure, much the same way as the internet backbone has been built out and scaled over the last 20 years. It's a rooted fabric, uses BGP for doing routing. So it is a completely simplified way of scaling your OpenStack. And we're working with um, Ubuntu Canonical to actually get Project Calico. It's in the oil program and it being part of one of the options you get as a distribution for, from OpenStack. So thank you very much. I will hand over back to Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, if you hang around, because I, I think we'll have questions in a few minutes, and uh, um, that'd be great. So Jean Durel, uh, it'd be great to come up the stage. So Jean is the co-founder of Telestax, and if you could maybe explain a little bit, little bit about Telestax and what you're doing. Thank you. Hi. Um, 
Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to the uh, Ubuntu uh, team to actually invite me to speak about uh, our integration uh, with Juju and uh, how we can scale uh, an AV and telecom environment. So I'm uh, John Dorriel. I'm one of the Telestax co-founders. And Telestax is the company behind the biggest open source telecommunication platform called Mobisense. Um, what we figured around building Mobisense over the past decade is that uh, building telecommunication services is hard and it takes a lot of time and integration. Um, so we thought that we would also, the, the number of people capable of building telecom services is very much reduced. So we thought about how we can go from there and uh, leverage people that uh, knows a lot of, about the web and uh, how to integrate communication services into web application or be able to build telecom services that are as easy as building web services. Um, so we wanted to tap uh, traditionally into the, the, the blue circle, which was the telecom um, developers, into tapping into a lot a more range of developers so that the telecom operators can actually um, uh, use an ecosystem of partners and developers to build innovation and help them in fighting OTT players. Um, so we built uh, a solution called Rescom that uh, we saw in this demo, uh, where Rescom is taking care of handling all the complicated stuff for the developers, which is all the, the traditional telecom uh, protocol, uh, like X SMPP, SS7, SIP, etc. So the web developers don't want to learn those new protocols, they just want to build innovative services. Um, so this platform allows you to integrate all communication features into your application, be it voice, messaging, uh, video, very easily with standard um, APIs or standard uh, language that web developers or mobile native application developers are very much used to. Um, we thought also that um, sometimes um, developing itself is too, too time consuming, uh, so build a visual tool uh, that you can use to actually do drag and drops um, to actually easily create new services. So we have a number of uh, um, verbs that you can use to actually do text-to-speech, uh, audio conferencing, um, DTMF recognition very easily. So you can build your IVR tree without having any type of development knowledge and do control the call flow of your calls directly from a visual tool, uh, which was actually used to build the, the demo application that we saw today. Um, the goal is really to make it as fast as possible for telecom operators to actually build new services and push them to market uh, so that they can focus really on innovation, new services, and add value to their subscribers. Um, so all of this is powered by our uh, communication platform, open source. Um, you will recognize um, typical um, components or network elements. I won't dive in too much into this, uh, this slide, but basically, Rescom exposes all the telecom uh, network core assets uh, in an easy way for web or mobile application developers. Um, it's also capable of doing Internet of Things. So typically we are focused on um, application to person or person to person, but Mobisense play a huge role also in the Internet of Things, as was shown by the FCC CTO, Enning Schulzin, um, in a conference uh, that happened last month. Um, but this is, um, the next step is operators don't have to develop everything themselves. So we want to introduce um, a telecom app store where um, the operators can actually leverage um, an ecosystem of partners, developers, and community of open source developers that already build application that can go to market today. Um, so we want actually to help the operator um, to install the solution and go to market right away without months of uh, building new application or a lot of millions of dollars um, to building new innovative services and integration work. So we want to be able for them um, to actually push some application that are available today from our partners of ecosystem um, to generate revenue right away when deploying the solution. And that's it. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, bring something to light. Uh, we were actually planning to do this demo a week from now on another event. I went on holidays last week and I told them, could you prepare a demo here? So in one week, they actually prepared a, a telecom demo. Actually, it was probably even less. So that's the type of 
time frame our team got uh, together with partners like Telestax and uh, made the switch uh, to make it. And that's a type of time frames that we would like everybody to be able to turn things around in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for our guest speakers. So I think we've got time for some Q&A before we do a, a, a final wrap-up um, from, from the room. Um, maybe some questions. Go ahead, sir. Hello. Hi. And if you introduce yourself, that'd be great. It's just about to do that. <laughs> great. So I'm Yuri Kutan. Uh, for sake of completeness, uh, my questions are solely mine and may or may not be questions of my company, which is Oracle. And I have a question to the MetaSwitch presenter. So uh, I understand the, uh, what you did was uh, I, I saw architecture, but I was not uh, really sure what the grant architecture does deliver. So is it like uh, telephony services? So basically, Project Clearwater provides IMS core. So in IMS terms, ICSCF, SCSCF, and BGCF functionality and sits in the core, core of a network. The, the Telestax was acting as an application server in IMS terminology. So uh, coming here and uh, cloud computing was uh, is new to me like since three weeks. I was, uh, I noticed in uh, many present, uh, presentations like Huawei that uh, a couple of those that uh, a major challenge they face is uh, predictability of performance, like the hypervisor eating uh, quite some time, uh, uh, impacting latency, impacting uh, jitter, and causing uh, a lot of other uh, hard to control, hard to predict uh, technical challenges. So I'm, I'm wondering if uh, within this demo you went into these, or if it was more like a functional demo, or okay, so even without, uh, <coughs> without uh, context of this demo generally, how, uh, how do you think uh, the, uh, this environment is ready for the uh, for uh, speech uh, and telecom clouds. Okay, so, so there are two sides to that. There's the signaling side. So as an IMS core, Project Clearwater is just in the control plane, just signaling. And there is the media components. Um, the media components and the media server was actually part of the Telestax application um, are much more sensitive to um, things like you said, like the hypervisor putting a halt on stuff and you know, like, if you, if you hold up your conversation for 200 milliseconds, everybody starts going, well, well what happened to the call cool drop and your conversation flow stops? So the media components are much more critical in terms of performance in OpenStack and cloud environments. Um, so Clearwater, Project Clearwater on the signaling side um, is actually, um, you need to measure the latency through the system and check whether you've got enough capacity to go through it and, and cope with bursts of traffic. So you might have, I don't know, the old classic thing was the American Idol. So so 8 o'clock, they say, dial into this number and the amount of traffic in the network suddenly shoots up. But there, it's more, it's a less difficult challenge to cope with the signaling load and signaling overload in the core of the network than the media. And to cope with the media overload, you need probably things like um, SRIOV or a open vSwitch, uh, like a um, vSwitch, which has been optimized to, to route traffic through um, Project Calico to, to route your traffic through. That's where you tend to see the problems with performance is actually routing through the networking stack in OpenStack. And as a company, we've got other products at play in that space. That's where we've had to put most effort in and is the most difficult technical challenge to resolve. So, okay, so if I may ask the media company representative <laughs> to answer the same question for me, please. So I would like to thank Paul, uh, which uh, actually replied to part of the question on the hypervisor layer, where you can do a lot of optimization on that. Uh, one thing we can see also is that OTT players already built their infrastructure on the cloud. So it's happening today, but they do provide voice video on the cloud. So if you look at... Uh, uh, Google Cloud, by example, providing Google Hangout type of services. Um, there is a lot of things you can do in terms of uh, monitoring the media server, um, the jitter buffer, and what's happening in the media to know the quality of your call. So you can uh, improve um, the boxes where it runs. And thanks to also Juju, you can run hybrid environments. So, by example, you can run the signaling side on the, on the public cloud, and you think that um, from your measurements that the virtualization layer is too much of a problem for the media, uh, you can also scale on hardware, typical hardware box, um, machine as a service. 
Yeah. So I think your, your point that we want predictable and deterministic performance from both the cloud and from the underlying hardware is absolutely noted. I think historically, the industry has had to go to very custom hardware with very custom versions of Linux. And in fact, one of the things that we're excited about working in this space right now is trying to bring that deterministic um, performance from a much more standard Ubuntu, I mean, and then all the way up through the cloud. So, agree. So, so I'm uh, really asking myself, Woody, I, I still feel there is some kind of sense of imperfection, and, I'm as, and I think there are some different opinions. I, I found a lot of tuning proposals here in the sessions, and some of them call it the deep drilling, TM, and some other call it super optimization, uh, uh, registered trademark, and whatsoever. Uh, but isn't that like uh, over time it would be beneficial if OpenStack had something like Amazon has, which is different types of instances? I, I heard someone proposing today we should have ten tens of thousands of types of instances which are optimized for storage, for network, sure. for this and that. I'm getting headache already now when I hear the number of 10,000. Yeah, I think you should get a, get a headache. Alan, I, I, we've got time for one last comment. Um, so, and I, I know we're out of time, but Alan, so, go ahead. So yeah, so I mean, I think you bring up some really good points, right? But most of these are just configuration. So for example, like what you're talking about, like, you know, for memory and cache costs, that's really got to do with configuration. So for example, like if you look and think a little bit differently about like vendors like ourselves have done in the past, so what we're really trying to do is recreate to have the same deterministic performance as if we would have on a monolithic runtime box in the cloud. And the way to do that is to have things like CPU core pinning, to have a specific accelerated vSwitch for a specific workload tailored. Take all of that and certify that on a Ubuntu host operating system. And there might be some additional tweaks that we need to do in the kernel, for example, on a Ubuntu host operating system to make sure that those VNF workloads actually work on any x86 platform or even an ARM platform or something else. OK? Thank you very much, Alan. All right, I'd like to um, just uh, wrap it up, say thank you very much. We've come to the end of our session. The key messages were, let's get a, a, an industry standard operating system out there that's cloud first. OpenStack is ready for the convergence of both data center and of the network itself. There's a, uh, an explosion of innovation now happening in terms of bringing both established VNFs or established applications from established vendors into a VNF status, as well as new players coming to the table. And we really think that we can attack that core problem that we set out at the beginning of, of making sure that telcos can respond to the challenges of uh, companies like WhatsApp with their, uh, their magic 32 uh, developers and 500 million users. Thank you very much for your time today.